welcome back to this set of advanced descriptive writing lessons. Today we're going to be looking at characterization, which uh, you can kind of guess by the name, it's to do with characters and creating characters. Isation generally is a suffix means um, the process of making or kind of developing something. So it's about how to develop a character basically. Most people when they think of characters, they have a very clear image in their head of what their character looks like and what type of person they are. Um, but they maybe don't go beyond that before they start writing. And uh, whether you're writing descriptive or narrative, you do want to spend a bit more time beyond that initial impression of your character to flesh them out and make them feel as real as possible. Yeah, so just before we start looking at these examples, actually, I'm going to just write a couple of things at the top that I want you to scribble down. So the first thing is um, you want to think of characters in two different ways. This also helps if you're writing a play or if you're writing a monologue, anything to do with characters, basically. Um, so static characters don't change. They are kind of fixed and predictable entities that you know every time they come on scene or on stage or into your, they appear in your description or in your story, how they're going to act. Um, they might be very complex developed things, but they don't change throughout the course of the story. And then you have dynamic characters, which are the opposite. They'll change throughout the course of the story, depending on whatever the story is. They might change for the positive or for the worse. Um, usually a dynamic character is what you want for your main character and maybe a couple of other key characters in your story. If you're doing a small descriptive piece for an exam, um, don't have too many dynamic characters because again, that's gonna kind of confuse your, your narrative. If you've only got a short space of time, maybe just have one dynamic character and the rest are static so that it's quite minimal and manageable within that time frame. So another thing to think about is um, development of characters. The way you want to do it is start with an initial impression. Um, if you have several characters, which normally you will have even in a descriptive piece or a narrative piece, um, make sure characters have distinctive personalities. The more distinctive they are, the easier it's gonna be to kind of create tension and drama and more kind of interesting stuff with your plot. So if they're all quite similar, um, try and think in, you know, in terms of like, even if they're quite similar, how are they slightly different? Are some more confident and less confident? Are they actually quite different deep down, but they try and copy each other? So try and find some difference and some complexity to those characters. Um, you want to think about appearance as much as personality, because with their appearance and how they how they dress and their mannerisms and how they come across to other people, a lot of the description in a story or in a descriptive piece is based around those mannerisms rather than dialogue. And normally, if you have multiple characters, you have to get across what type of person they are via how they dress, how they behave, and how they speak. So the appearance is really important because it gives us a lot of information about that character. And the more you can um, flesh that out and the clearer that is in your head, the easier uh, you're going to be able to convey their personality to your audience. Um, and you also think about inner psychology. Um, I, I even kind of like read a few psychology books and started vaguely teaching psychology at one point because it's so linked to characterization. And obviously this is a higher level thing. It's not like a, you know, don't do this if you're just kind of starting out at your GCSE and you just want a pass grade. This is a like push your levels and try and get deeper into your um, story to achieve something quite complex and difficult. So if you're thinking this is way too much and I don't have time, that's totally fine because you don't need to, you don't need to think about the inner psychology to get an A grade on an exam. But 
if you're a bit of a perfectionist like I am, or you're writing for other reasons, or you're trying at higher levels to do creative writing, then this can really help open up the characters to you. So you can get a greater sense of who they are as a person. And it's it's good sometimes if you kind of like push into your character's flaws and you're aware of what problems they have as well as what's good about them. And we're going to look at that in a minute when we read through these passages because these are not perfect characters that we're dealing with here, which makes them more interesting and also feel a lot more real. So I have a look now at the first extract. This is from The Secret History by Donna Tart. Uh, she's got a film out called The Gold Finch that is uh, her latest book turned into a film and I'm really excited about going to see it soon. I have no idea if it's good. But this is her first novel and um, she wrote it when she was 28, so pretty young. So we're going to look at a character that she makes called Bunny. I'm not really going to tell you anything about the story because um, you don't really need to know. I want you to just think about the way that she describes and draws this character out for us and the choices of the words and how those affect our very specific perception of this character. As I read uh, this for the first time, I kind of thought that it must have been a passage that she spent a long time on that she kind of revised several times and something that she kind of tweaked and adjusted and spent time on until she could find the exact mode of expression. And if you've got the freedom to do that with your descriptions, you definitely want to be doing that. So you want to do multiple drafts and leave it for a bit, come back at it, <laughs> come back to it later and think about it more. If you're in an exam, obviously you're not given that kind of liberty, so um, do the best you can. <laughs> but if you kind of thought and planned before you actually start writing, that kind of the plan functions as your kind of first draft in your head, and then your second draft is what you actually write. So it does tend to be of a better quality than if you just started writing straight away and kind of just pouring it all out on the page. So yeah, um, we'll have a look at it. I'm going to read it aloud. As I read aloud, I want you to just think about um, images, words, mannerisms, appearance, possibly how that appearance creates an inner psychology or a feeling of an inner psychology of this character. And also whether you think Bunny might be a static or dynamic character. Bunny had an uncanny ability to ferret out topics of conversation that made his listener uneasy and to dwell upon them with, the, with ferocity once he had. In all the months I'd known him, he never ceased to tease me, for instance, about that jacket I'd worn to lunch with him that first day, and about what he saw as my flimsy and tasteless Californian-style dress. To an impartial eye, my clothes were, in fact, not at all dissimilar from his own, but his snide remarks upon the subject were so inexhaustible and tireless, I think, because in spite of my good-natured laughter, he must have been dimly aware that he was touching a nerve that I was in fact incredibly self-conscious about these virtually imperceptible differences of dress and of the rather less imperceptible differences of manner and bearing between myself and the rest of them. I am gifted at blending myself into any given milieu. You've never seen such a typical California teenager as I was, nor such a dissolute and callous pre-med student. But somehow, despite my efforts, I'm never able to blend myself in entirely and remain, in some respects, quite distinct from my surroundings. In the same way that a green chameleon remains a distinct entity from the green leaf upon which it sits, no matter how perfectly it has approximated the subtleties of the particular shade. Whenever Bunny rudely and in public accused me of wearing a shirt which contained a polyester blend, or remarked critically that my perfectly ordinary trousers, indistinguishable from his own, bore the taint of something he called a western cut. A large portion of the pleasure the sport afforded him was derived from his unerring and bloodhoundish sense that this, of all topics, was the one which made me most truly uncomfortable. Bit of a complex passage, as you can see. Um, I'm going to give you some time to kind of pick it apart. So I want you to just have a look at the first section and think about it. So it's a, it's about two characters, there's Bunny and this I. I is the first person narrator of the story. And it's about their mannerisms and their personality. And it cleverly kind of uses 
a dialogue between a parent, so Bunny's appearance versus the appearance of the main character, in order to kind of fully flesh out both types of characters and create that kind of tension that I was talking about earlier. So you can see that they're not the same character, they're not, uh, even though one is trying to copy the other and trying to fit in, he's actually different and he doesn't fit in. And that's really well um, layered into the, the description. The style of the secret history is very long sentences, as you can see, um, copying a kind of modern Victorian style, I suppose she goes for. So um, yeah, it takes you a while to kind of get used to that style of writing. But when you're when you're kind of absorbed in it, it really grips you and you keep reading it. So I do recommend um, having a go at reading the secret history if you haven't already. So yeah, I'm going to pause the lesson for a second and you can take as long as you need. I recommend probably like five minutes, not too long, just so that you're um, not bored and you're just kind of <laughs> practicing the skill. You don't have to find every single word or description. After um, I've paused it, I'm going to show you the bottom half so that you can see the, because uh, it's quite a long extract, you can see the second bit as well. Um, so yeah can uh, pause now for as long as you need and I'll pause too and then we can come back and uh, see how see what you came up with okay so hopefully you've had a bit of time to think about it I just kind of skim read it and highlighted two colors so one for bunny one for the main character who's not really named in this passage so um, yeah, that should help you distinguish the characterization that's going on there. And you might have got some of the ones I got. You might have got some different ones as well. I definitely didn't get all of them. And um, yeah, hopefully you've now got a good feeling for what type of person Bunny is and what type of person the main character is and how they're characterized quite differently. So Bunny, I like this word ferret. <laughs> He ferrets out topics of conversation, so he kind of burrows and sort of finds them. Um, it's quite sneaky. It's a good, uh, a good description. And he loves to make people uneasy. And he's quite ferocious, so when he starts to make someone feel uneasy, he keeps going and he's really motivated and excited by that. He loves to tease the main character. He makes snide remarks. And he's inexhaustible and tireless with his remarks. And then later, he, he accuses the main character of wearing a shirt that contains a polyester blend, which is basically like a not natural material. It's kind of plastic material. Most clothes that people wear are polyester, but um, sometimes you, if you're picky <laughs> or if you're very wealthy or... Um, if you're hyper, you need special uh, hypoallergenic material, you might wear things that are like pure cotton, pure cashmere, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and he remarks critically on the main character's clothes. So, Bunny is not a nice character. Hopefully you've uh, come around to that, but instead of the writer just stopping at the point where she was like, okay, I've got this character Bunny and he's annoying, she's gone into so much detail about how is this guy annoying, what specifically does he do, what are his mannerisms, he's not just annoying but he's tireless, he's not just annoying but he's clearly very intelligent and very perceptive and he can find details that give the main character away that are not there for other people. So the guy almost manages to blend in, but because of this bunny guy, he can't quite. He's always kind of having a go at him. And we don't know from this passage whether bunny is like this with everyone or whether he just has a bone to pick with the main character, but we can see that he's quite a strong, fierce kind of character um, and very tireless. On the other hand, the main character who's the, the narrator um, he wears a jacket, um, he has a Californian style that he, he mentions a couple of times. Um, Bunny calls his style flimsy and tasteless. 
he tries to laugh it off with a good natured laugh. So he tries to kind of ignore this nuisance character. Um, but he knows that it, it does actually touch a nerve deep down and gets kind of angry and makes him feel self-conscious. Um, and there's a few more descriptions there. So what we get is an impression that the, the narrator is very shy and very nervous about how he comes across for some reason and how he appears to other people. And he also doesn't want to stand out and be kind of different and crazy. He want, just wants to blend in and he wants to be a normal guy. And this bunny is constantly on his back, preventing him from being a normal guy and for some reason loves to make him feel uneasy and kind of, um, yeah, make him feel like he knows that he's not actually one of one of the group. So there's a lot of stuff going on there and you can see that it took a while to kind of realize in your head or in the writer's head that dynamic um, between these characters and how it works. And then um, this idea of the, the sort of tension that's created through the dress and the way that they describe the dress and how that becomes a kind of sparring ground for their personalities as well, which are kind of clashing at this point, even though one's introverted and one's extroverted, um, they're equally like, they're kind of annoyed with one another for different reasons. So yeah, hopefully you can see how through little details and little descriptions, especially mannerisms and appearance, um, how that can build a really big picture of a character and also how um, we create something called a foil, which is a really good word to write down, F-O-I-L. So foil is like if you put two characters into a description or a story and they're very distinct from one another, they can kind of contrast with each other and emphasize each other's characteristics. And really amazing writers use foils a lot. So like Shakespeare, for example, has tons of foils in his drama. So that's another way to achieve a high level of characterization. So I'll just scroll down. I'm not actually going to spend time on this because only a tiny little bit that ran over and that's because I did that little writing at the top. <laughs> um, but if you wanted to just kind of finish off the last few sentences, you're welcome to pause here if you like. Once we carry on, this word bloodhoundish, by the way, is a word. She just kind of made it up, but um, it's definitely a word. You know what it means. <laughs> so I disagree with uh, my word processor there saying it's not a word. Yeah, so this is another one, one of my favourite ever writers, sadly not still living. Um, some people might have studied her at school. People do study under Angela Carter at school. She wrote a book of stories called The Bloody Chamber and Other Stories. That's one of my favourite ever things anyone's ever written and um, this is one of my favourite stories from that collection so you're in for a treat and uh, yeah this is about um, the reason I chose this one a little bit different so it, it shows a very well thought out well developed character and it has that kind of appearance versus inner psychology thing but it also extends that to the environment of the character so if you have a character who is in their space, like they live there or they work there and it's a place that, you know, they inhabit a lot and they kind of imprint their personality onto, then you want to think of it a setting as well as an extension of a character's appearance and an extension of their inner psychology. So um, this is a very, very kind of like rich, dense example of how to do that. So I'm going to read it to you and then we can analyse. Um, it stops mid-word because it's just a, a chunk taken from a book. Um, wearing an antique bridal gown, the beautiful queen of the vampire sits all alone in her dark high house under the eyes of the portraits of her demented and atrocious ancestors. Each one of whom through her projects a baleful posthumous existence. She's counting out the tarot cards, ceaselessly constructing a constellation of possibilities, as if the random fall of the cards on the red plush tablecloth before her could precipitate her from her chill, shuttered room into a country of perpetual summer, 
and obliterate the per perennial sadness of a girl who is both death and the maiden. Her voice is filled with distant sonorities, like reverberations in a cave. Now you are at the place of annihilation. Now you're at the place of annihilation. And she is herself a cave full of echoes. She is a system of repetitions. She is a closed circuit. Can a bird sing only the song it knows or can it learn a new song? She draws her long sharp fingernail across the bars of the cage in which her pet lark sings, rousing in the metal a plangent twang like that of a plucked heartstrings of a woman of metal. Her hair falls down like tears. The castle is mostly given over to ghostly occupants, but she herself has her own suite of, the, of drawing room and bedroom. Closely barred shutters and heavy velvet curtains keep every leak of natural light out. There's a round table on a single leg covered with a red plush cloth on which she lays out her inevitable tarot. This room is never more than faintly illuminated by a heavily shaded lamp on the mantelpiece and the dark red figured wallpaper is obscurely, distressingly patterned by the rain that drives in through the neglected roof and leaves behind it random areas of anthropophagus lovers. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that word. I know what it means then. Depredations of rotten fungus everywhere. The unlit chandelier is so heavy with dust, the individual prisms no longer show any shapes. Industrious spiders have woven canopies in the corners of this ornate and rotting place, have trapped the porcelain vases on the mantelpiece, and so on. So, you get an idea. Tarot, by the way, T-A-R-O-T, if you're wondering, is a type of kind of like magical ancient card system. Some people think it came from Italian times in the 1600s, um, but some people think it's really ancient, like Egyptian or older. And uh, yeah, it's a way of, uh, you have like cards, they have symbols on them and you kind of lay them out in a pattern and it, it sort of answers questions in your head and tells you the future. So it's sort of like a magical fortune telling device, but some people think it's actually more of a kind of like it's got like a psychological basis to it and it helps you sort out things in your mind. Um, but yeah, they're, they're used in divination, which is like a form of fortune telling. So they're kind of an interesting magical phenomenon. Um, yeah, so she's not named this lady. I don't think she's ever named in, in the story actually. Um, but we know that she's queen of the vampires and she's wearing a bridal gown at the beginning. So I want you to, again, just spend a little bit of time here, maybe five minutes, maybe a little bit longer. Pick out a few phrases that kind of stand out to you, that encapsulate this character's personality. And try and pick out a few things that are deliberately kind of direct descriptions of her and then pick out some other things that are indirectly describing her through the setting and through the environment that she's in. Um, and if you're kind of confused by bits of this, don't worry, because it is confusing at first. <laughs> but I promise you, it's a really amazing story. And um, I think, I don't know how many times I've read it, there's still bits of it I didn't quite get, but that's what I kind of like about it, because I like things that are difficult and challenging. So um, yeah, so I'll, you can pause now, have, a little bit of time trying to find things that demonstrate characterization and then come back to the class when you're ready. So hopefully you got a few uh, kind of interesting things out of that. It's, um, it's very dense and rich. Both of these extracts contain challenging and unusual vocabulary and I chose that on purpose because this is a high level descriptive writing class and one thing you have to do is really kind of push yourself with your vocab. So instead of just saying wearing an old wedding dress, you'd say an antique bridal crown, a <laughs> bridal crown, I can't even say it, you'd say the other one <laughs> that I can't pronounce for some reason now. Um, instead of saying, let me see if I can find this, another thing, um, portraits of her family, it says portraits of her demented and atrocious ancestors. It's got extra detail and description and richness there, but it also, by choosing those unusual and interesting words, 
creates a very specific image of a very specific place that would be a lot more general if you just said pictures of her family and wearing a dress, wedding dress, you know, the, the kind of um, richness of the adjectives there and the sort of specificity of them, the fact that they're really specific helps to create this kind of dense, rich and personal kind of imagery. Uh, yeah, so a couple of things that I really loved from this one. I can't actually highlight it because I think I copied it from somewhere. Um, I really like the bit that talks about the demented and atrocious ancestors because it suggests that all of her family are terrible. Demented means crazy and atrocious means horrible, like you can't stand them. It suggests that she's maybe different from the rest of her family um, and that she comes from a very bad, horrible family. Um, and then I quite like this ceaselessly construing a constellation because you've got the the repeated kind of C sound there, the um, alliteration of the C, which creates a sort of looping image that really evokes what she's doing with the tarot, where she's completely, she's kind of doing it again and again and again, just asking loads of questions as if it could kind of save her or help her. Um, I like the phrase perennial sadness, means that she's always sad and always in a state of sadness, which I think is quite beautiful as well as sad and quite emotional. Um, I like the skipping forward a little bit, this uh, kind of bird, she's got a cage with a pet lark, so a type of bird, it doesn't just say her pet bird or her bird, it says pet lark. Um, larks are known for really beautiful song as well. So it's a useful image to have. Um, so yeah, she kind of runs her fingernail across the, the bird cage. And it's not the bird that sings, but it's the metal. Makes this kind of beautiful sound, this plungent twang, which is a nice combination of words. Um, yeah, and it, it kind of feels like this trapped bird in this cage is, is a symbol for the character so it's creating a sense of who she is as a person through kind of how she's imitating herself through the surroundings so it's really complex quite layered sort of metaphorical world that she lives in and that's extended in the last paragraph by the castle um i think it's quite shocking that uh where's the bit about rain <laughs> Yeah, distressingly patterned. So the, there's wallpaper and it's it's distressed by the rain that comes in through the roof and leaves staining. It's kind of like sinister and sort of ominous, but also quite tragic because clearly this, uh, if she's got portraits on the walls and she's wearing antique clothes, she's clearly in a kind of rich place and her family are, are wealthy. So it's sort of uh, interesting that it's kind of gone to ruin this place and it feels like that's sort of what happened to her family and that's her history as well. Yeah, and there's kind of interesting things going on with light as well. You might have picked up on a couple of images to do with light and how it's kind of shadowy or kind of lights aren't working and um, yeah, and they're casting more shadows than they are illuminating anything and there's no natural light because there's these heavy velvet curtains. So hopefully you found some of those ideas in there and you've got a good feeling for what type of character this is and she's obviously a completely different type of character to the the first two that we looked at so she's quite mythological and folkloric and magical and um, not real whereas the other two are very realistic and they feel quite down to earth and quite, quite grounded in reality. So that's to do with your personal style, your interests, your question, um, your themes that you want to explore. You can write in quite a realistic way, you can write in quite a fantastical sort of magical way, depending on what you're interested in and what your particular task is. I tend to write both, which is why I had picked these depending on what I'm trying to achieve with my story. So you can switch between both if you like as well. 
So yeah, that kind of concludes the characterization lesson. If you wanted any extensions here, I would um, go back to characters that you've created already and start applying these principles to them. So um, try and flesh out a character that you've come up with or say there's someone that you have struggled writing from the point of view of, see if you can flesh them out a bit using some of these techniques. And if you don't have any like that, you can try a descriptive writing question. Um, there will be some coming up later in this course as well. So you can try some of those questions and, and apply those characterization principles to them. So hopefully you found that really useful and uh, it's gonna help enhance the depth and kind of quality of your characters. And um, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed the lesson as well. I, I really enjoyed this one because I, I love rereading random snippets of my favorite things. I find it really fun. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I'll stop rambling now. Thank you for listening and uh, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you.